Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head, and in this episode, I'm talking to Mark Woodward. He is the head of occupational delivery at Neurobox. He has over 13 years' experience of working with neurodiversity, and he uses this experience to design and deploy equality, diversity, and inclusion policies at the workplace. For full disclosure, Neurobox are a great sponsor for this podcast, but they don't have any influence on what I ask or the editing of this episode, like all guests. So Mark will be treated the same, even though his employer is Neurobox. And as always, I'll put links to anything we talk about in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, Matt. It's great to have you here. So where I thought I'd kick off our conversation today is life before working in neurodiversity. Now, I've got you down as a senior manager and working in occupational roles, but why did you start with that? Well, that's an interesting question, and I think I probably have to go back a little bit to try to put some sense into it. But I started my working life off um, in a really exciting industry, selling Mm -hmm. metal to engineering companies. Oh, Uh, yes. It was (laughs) (laughs) Actually, to be fair, it was a little bit more interesting than it sounds. Um, But uh, I started working for a small company at that time. um, And I was actually with that organization for the best part of 21 years. And Yes, I know. Um, I kind of grew as the company grew, took on sort of bigger roles and more responsibility and so on and so forth until... Toward the end of my time there, I was the um, operations director for what was at the time five production warehouses and a sort of a large multi million pound company. Um, mm. The manager decided it was time to retire and sold the organization to a, a large sort of international corporate, yeah. which was supposed to be great for everybody. Um, but what I found, <laughs> I, I very, very quickly discovered that my role then was becoming not one of a of a creator, if you like, and enabling growth, but actually I was dismantling everything that I'd helped build over the last 21 oh, years. Oh, God, right. And also at that time, there were some other changes going on that made me find it very difficult to work in that particular type of environment and atmosphere. And I was offered the opportunity of voluntary redundancy, mm-hmm. um, which I grabbed with both hands, Yeah, yeah. took the money, ran away, and then sat down and went, what the heck am I going to do with the rest of my life now? Um, and really all I knew was that I did not want to go back into that environment. Yes. So with the help, really, really great um, coach, um, I spent some time exploring what it was that I got out of my previous roles um, mm. and, ah, and, and all that really good stuff. And it was actually, it was genuinely, genuinely fascinating. And what I learned was actually what really, really got me excited and, and motivated was all the different things that I did to support others, really. Um, mm. And so I focused on training and coaching as a career going forward. Went to all sorts of requalifications and everything else. Um, and as is often the case, I find when I done this at about the right sort of time, I was applying for various positions, but one popped up with an organization that worked in the um, in the neurodiversity sector and specifically okay. training people on the sorts of assistive technology which we're familiar with. Um, So I jumped into this role and very, very quickly realized that, A, it was I loved it, but but also, secondly, the people that I was teaching and training, I had an awful lot in common with them. And actually, (laughs) do you know what? Some of this software, I could have really done with this in my Mm. previous roles and life had been a little bit easier. So it was that kind of journey of self-discovery, if you think, if you you like. And and that sort of led me on to, to... really become passionate about the whole area of neurodiversity and disability in general. And being a bit of a geek, the assistive technology side of things really, really appealed to me. Um, mm. <laughs> but um, I, I, it really started to get exciting when I sort of um, spread my wings a little bit uh, and moved away from the training side of things and moved more into the coaching side of things. 
um, which I absolutely love doing. Um, or with Neurobox, working with, with some absolutely lovely people and people that ironically I've worked with many, many years before as well. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit like going home working with Neurobox for me. Um, <laughs> and, and now I, I get the chance to do not just the, the work with individuals uh, in the workplace, coaching and so on, but actually on an organizational level, helping mm. organizations become good at this inclusive thing. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> one thing i want to dig into before we dive into all the sort of neurobox and coaching and stuff is the coaching you've got so 21 years i mean you mm. must have been what would you been like in your 40s at that point yeah that would have yeah. been about right yeah so we're aging you now 13 years in neurodiversity <laughs> yeah yeah we're getting that. so i thought it's really interesting like i've gone through career change in my sort of 20s to 30s um but your coach really started pulling out things you really enjoyed. How did that come about and how did you sort of shift gears with that? Well, it was, um, I'm not going to pretend it was an easy part of my life. Um, no, no. It, it, it came about, if I'm being totally honest, out of desperation. Mm. Um, I came away from my previous position, um, not in a great mental place. Um, oh, okay. but just knowing that actually I needed to get away, um, had the security, if you like, of a, of a, of a, of a decent check behind me. Um, cause I've been there for 21 years and it wasn't yeah. a small company. So, you know, I, yeah. I had a little bit of breathing space, um, which allowed me to, to basically do nothing for two or three weeks and then start realizing at some point I've got to decide what I'm going to do with my rest of my life because you know, yeah. kids can't live on beans on toast forever. <laughs> and that's when I started to look around and think, well, what are my options? Wasn't anything that I could see that, that motivated me. So then it was, um, well, what are you going to do then? And, and actually I'd had some coaching before earlier on. Uh, in my working career um and so i i thought well let's let's do that again let's go and talk to somebody who can help pull this out of me and it, it was a really really um i'm not gonna say life-changing but it was it was a, a massive impact it, it really did yeah 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 it's kind of because it's tricky isn't it when like face we didn't see and imagine as you say you go around clicking for different roles and online and all that kind of thing mm. And if none of it sort of excites you at all, there must be that crisis of confidence like, what do I do? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It, it really, I, really was. It was a horrible, it was a horrible situation to be in. But, um, look at, if looking back on it in hindsight, I mean, it, it, it had to happen. It was great. It was probably the best thing that ever happened to me or, or one of the best things that ever happened to me. It was great. But obviously when you're going through these things, it doesn't feel like that. But no, um, definitely not having no. gone through it in the last few years. Yes. With hindsight, it's, it's great, isn't it? It's but, great. But at the time it's really, really painful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So no, it was, um, it wasn't, uh, an active plan. It was out of desperation because yeah. I didn't know what the heck else to do quite frankly no, that's a good point of how important <laughs> coaching is and you actually find things you really enjoy about that job and to reapply it somewhere else which you would have never have ever thought of without that person kind of pulling it out of you i would, would have thought exactly right exactly right okay so obviously you ended up in the neurodiversity industry but let's sort of cast your mind back what was your first kind of experience with dyslexia when did you start sort of feeling dyslexia or knowing people with dyslexia exist and well my my first experience with dyslexia um when i met my wife because her not she well she's not diagnosed with dyslexia but certainly um <laughs> her, her younger brother is um okay. and um he, he he sort of struggled with all the usual dyslexic types of difficulties through school and so on and so forth um and it was at that point that i really started to understand what dyslexia meant mm. um and, and and to be honest back then that was probably really about the first time i'd even ever heard of it quite frankly yeah but even when i spent my wife many many years ago that that didn't really have a bearing on anything other than the fact that actually when i'd sat down and, and spoken to to him i won't name him but spoken to him um, <laughs> again it's like well doesn't everybody find i find that difficult i struggle doesn't everybody struggle with that and so yeah it's a it's all a journey isn't it 
It is indeed. Yes, yes. So obviously you sort of saw that and things, but would you then just kind of sort of ticked along with it? Did you meet anybody during your previous job in, because obviously you're quite so senior when you're getting into operations mm-hmm. in the steel and engineering industry that tends to sort mm-hmm. of be the STEMI kind of thing that would ex- attract more neurodiverse people? Was that something you were aware of? At the time, no. Um, looking back now, yes, with, with what I know, uh, almost definitely. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely, almost definitely. Um, but no, obviously at the time I, I had no idea. Um, it was really once I started sort of working with, essentially with dyslexic people more than more than anything else, um, that I started to learn a lot about it. Um, and that's when I started, as I said before, to sort of identify with some of these things. But <laughs> uh, yeah. well, I thought that was everybody, surely. Um, but yeah, so um, realistically, not 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 consciously, I don't think, until I started to work actually in the industry. Um, but looking back, yeah, my whole life, basically. Yeah, yes. Yeah, and you say you started identifying with things. So have you ever sort of decided to go through a formal diagnosis yourself or...? Uh, this is a conversation I've had lots of times and, and, and put a lot and a lot of thought into. And mm-hmm. there's a part of me that feels, well, I should, um, yes. you know, because that's what's expected. And that's probably what I'd advise other people to do. I, I don't know. But then yeah. there's another big part of me that thinks, well, you know, realistically, at this point, what's it going to add to my life? And the honest truth is right now, I don't think it's going to add anything. Um, I'm working for an organization that couldn't be more supportive. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. I've got access to any assistive technology I might need. I'm in a very lucky position that way. And, you know, the other side of it is I, I don't have a spare seven or eight hundred pound line around it. <laughs> <laughs> so when I put all that together, I'm thinking, you know what, I'm okay at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I could appreciate not having a, a spare few hundred pound around for that kind of thing. Um, but it's interesting you mentioned being in an organisation, doing the coaching, and being near assistive technology, people who know about neurodiversity, including yourself. So are you using some of the techniques already, even though you kind of don't have the formal badge, so to speak? Mm, yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, so I, I make use of lots of assistive tech in my role. I'm regularly using the, the sort of the staples, if you like, um, yeah. like, like Dragon, um, the text to speech softwares. I must admit, I don't use that often. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely the note-taking side of things is probably one of my biggest challenges. The note-taking and the organization, I spend a lot of time organizing myself and playing around with systems of organization, if you like. Um, that's my uh, that's my Achilles heel, I think. And it's really interesting because when I start to feel overwhelmed or stressed, that's the first thing that I go to is is the structure of the organization um, because that that's my weak area if you like yeah it's really interesting yeah see I, I've noticed this actually with myself recently I've just um, moved over from physical paper to a remarkable tablet and mm. having it all folded and structured in all that and it's like wow this thing's amazing I have everything structured exactly the same as I do for the CAD system on a computer each project split by vehicle time, all that kind of fun stuff, separate bits of meetings. It's like how much easier it is just to get everything organized rather than thumbing through four yeah. different pages to catch the notes that you wrote for the first meeting and then you haven't left enough space when you've had four meetings left over. And it, yeah. I'm interested in interest, that sort of structural foundation, how that can help in a way I never really realized, I think. <laughs> it's fundamental, I find myself. Mm. Um, I've learned that if... I feel a little bit out of control or I feel like I've got too much going on at any one particular time. Um, it's nearly always because I haven't got a handle on the structure, the organization of things. And if I put a bit of time into sorting that side of our things out, 
computing systems sorted out, get my notes up to date, whatever it means, um, then everything suddenly becomes a bit clearer. It's, it's almost like there are two kinds of stressors, if you like. There's the, the stress of actually doing your job. Mm -hmm. And then there's the stress of actually knowing what it is you're meant to be doing at any one particular time. And it's that yes. the one that yes. I get stressed about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> doing the job, that's the easy bit. <laughs> yes, knowing what is required at this particular moment can be very tricky to and and, and and feeling comfortable that I'm not missing anything, that I'm mm. not going to let anybody down. Um, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's the thing, I think. Yes, yes. But how did you become aware of that, actually, that sort of structural note thing? How did, where did you kind of get the feel for that? Oh, that's about 30 seconds ago, I think, that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was one of the things that I, I I've always, <laughs> I've always, always known. Um, yeah. Even going back to you know, many many years ago, I was I was always kind of a bit of a neat freak, if you like. Um, <laughs> yes, but, yes. But, but what I've learned over the two, <laughs> yeah, you recognise that. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, a, yeah, yeah. You're a control freak, and I, and actually, what I find is that no, it's not about neatness and it's not about control. It's just about knowing that those things are where they're meant to be, so that I can focus all of my processing power. On what needs to be done. Mm. Um, it's almost like I was trying to explain this to somebody the other day, actually. It's like, um, I can't cook a meal in the kitchen if the kitchen isn't completely tidy first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. I think the reason for that is because actually cooking the meal requires all of my processing power. And I don't really have anything left over for going, where the flipping X that saucepan? Where's that dish? Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> it needs to be where I know it is. Then I can focus on what I'm meant to be doing. Yeah. And I think that's exactly the same with workplace, you know? Yes. I yeah. know where the files are. I haven't got to waste time trying to find the files because if I do, the chances are that my neuro different brain is going to go off on a completely different tangent. And I'm going to forget what I was looking for those files for in the first place. Uh, and I can't allow that to happen. Yes. 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 I, I agree. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting when you, you have partners or people or flatmates, whoever you live with, that I'm almost in awe of them where they can have, let's, let's run with the cooking example, where everything is everywhere and somehow they seem to be able to automatically <laughs> grab it. Like, yes, yes. What? <laughs> and, and, and out of chaos comes this amazing thing. You think, how do you do that? Yeah, it looks like a minor hand grenade has been thrown yeah. up in. <laughs> how? How? Like the knives go there and... <laughs> like yeah the meal was all right but connect the kitchen's tidy isn't it <laughs> <laughs> chop that move that over there do that, you know exactly, exactly. <laughs> places of holding areas yeah <laughs> yeah and it is and i sometimes have always sort of thought that even before i dived in deeper into the world of neurodiversity and understood my dyslexia better like <laughs> i used to engineering term you put everything down as much stuff down to standard process as you can so the car keys in the wallet are in the same mm. drawer and i'm going out the doors so automatically grab there the house keys are in the same place and all this kind of stuff and the moment something is in standard process it's going to get left behind or it's going to be that other thing where it robs processing capacity where you know it comes around in my brain remember the mm. car keys remember the car keys and there's just this voice that's spinning around because clearly that's me trying to refresh my limited working memory all the time and it's like come mm. around and around and it's like ah i just need to sort this now and then we can carry on <laughs> yeah that's it but that's when the anxiety and then the stress starts to kick in because it's not necessarily worrying about remembering these things it's worrying about what might happen if you don't remember these things yes. um who am i going to let down what's that going to lead to and one of the things that we're probably all aware of is that our dyslexic brains are very, very creative, imaginative tools, which is great, but it's also a curse when you spend lots of time thinking about all the bad things that could happen, because my brain can come up with lots of bad things that might happen if this doesn't happen or I don't get that in on time. Yes, yes. Yep. Um, and that then leads 
feeds into the stress and the anxiety. And very often, the only way to break that cycle is to stand back and go, right, well, I tell you what, then, if I organize things a little bit better, maybe this won't happen. Okay, yeah. So then I spend an inordinate amount of time <laughs> organizing things. That then leads to other things not getting done. But ultimately, <laughs> do you know what? It could be even simple things like if, if halfway through the day, I just feel like it's getting all away from me and I... There's, there's a million people I'm meant to call back and emails are piling up. Sometimes just spending 10 minutes making, scribbling a list on my on my remarkable hey. uh, of, of all the things <laughs> that I've got to do by the close of the day. Even yes. that can sometimes just be all it takes. But um, just sometimes putting some order into things um, is, is really, really important for me. And... There's a there's a whole thing around this as well because if you think about what's going on, the more processing power that you're dedicating to the stress, the anxiety, to the catastrophizing, the less you've mm. got to actually focus on the task at hand. But something else happens as well when we become stressed and we go over into that state of stress, that fight or flight mode, whatever you want to call it. Lots of things happen to us physically, um, which mm. you probably be aware of, um, hearts beat faster and all that sort of stuff. But also cognitively, uh, massive changes happen. And one of the things that happens quite quickly is that it changes the way that we think. Normally, we're all quite critical thinking beings. We're yes. used to questioning. We're used to thinking things through. But our stress brains can't afford for us to do that if we're confronted with a danger our brains can't afford for us to start asking silly questions like well maybe it's not as dangerous as i think um, <laughs> may, maybe i'll be all right maybe i'll get lucky all our, them daft questions oh yeah <laughs> exactly our stress brains go no my job is to keep you alive forget those questions we're just getting away so like response becomes, you know, we become very reactive beings. We, we act without thinking. That's what we're designed to do in a stress situation. But of course, when that stress situation is a work task or a situation, losing that ability to think critically means that very often we no longer have access to the strategies that we know work. Okay. We no longer have access to querying the information, asking questions. We just become reactive and we've just got to get this out the door as quickly as we possibly can and we just rush through it. So there's a lot happens when we get into that stress state. So very often, and this is something that comes up quite frequently in coaching, we can talk about strategies and ways of working and all this good stuff. But ultimately, if we're in that state of stress, the chances are none of that stuff's actually going to work because our stress brain is going to fight us and it's going to, we haven't got time for any of that. Okay. This needs to be done now or this, this, and this is going to happen. So we go along with our stress brain because our stress brains had hundreds of thousands of years to get really good at this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a pro at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, learning to notice those signs that that's happening and and understanding a little bit about how to manage that is really the first step to any types of sort of assistive technology or strategies or anything else that we want to talk about yeah yeah the whole yeah sorry i went on a bit there didn't i matt sorry about that it's fine long form podcast that is <laughs> part of the, the way it works it's just good <laughs> we sort of delve deeper into it and that's really useful so and it's interesting, I was just thinking with the kind of planning thing and one of the one of the thing I want to do to write and something I've had to learn is that you don't make the planning stiff. You know, the planning is there, but it's not this stiff thing that you the moment any minute force touches it, it, it all falls over. It's gotta be this kind of plan that you can hold you you hold with like strong conviction, but it's held quite with a loose grip so it can be changed at any minute kind of thing it's a bit like having a plane that's set on a course all the little flaps and stuff move on the plane to keep it going but it keeps keeps going to the course you let it do its thing underneath you sometimes i love that analogy that's really i might steal that that's really really good yeah yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're, you're absolutely right um 
and, and and that's the thing with these structures if you like and 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 the way that we plan and organize in our own sort of systems and methods they need to be robust but they also need to be flexible and that's yes. a really difficult combination to have yes. and one of the things that i struggle with quite a lot is the fact that i do work quite closely with assistive technology and i'm a bit of a computer geek and there's stuff coming out all the time and mm-hmm. all the time i'm looking for the perfect solution. Ah, brilliant. If I could just incorporate that into this, that would be brilliant. Um, but it doesn't exist. It, it just doesn't exist. And you're constantly kind of adapting and changing things. Um, but that's okay, I think. I think that needs to happen. Um, but you just need to be conscious of it as well, I think. Yes. So, yeah. And getting used to the ground moving ever so slowly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. So. Let's dive into, in fact, how had your career change in our working with people with neurodiversity, doing on sort of inclusion as well? What was the first thing that surprised you when you started doing that new job? You've done all the training, all the coaching, and you've dived into it. What was like, wow? Um, this is going to sound really, really sad. But I think uh-huh. the thing that surprised me more than anything else was the sh- What's the sheer joy I got out of it? Oh, I brilliant. hadn't felt yeah. that for a long, for many, many years. Mm. And actually, it was really important to me to notice that I could still feel that way about something. Um, so, no, that was oh, a really, good. really big thing for me. That sounds really, really, um, yeah, I'm not sure, but it's the truth. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> I feel like I should be lying down on a couch, Matt. <laughs> you can lie down if you like <laughs> it's audio only just <laughs> you mean your hour-long therapy session that goes out to the world yeah. <laughs> no that's really cool and it's i bet that makes you work harder in the job as well as it invigorates you to do more because you're finding it really exciting yeah absolutely absolutely and because it's not it's not a job it's not something that i do as a living it's something that actually i want to do um and i often joke to people it sort of took me 40 odd years to find something i enjoy doing but uh, mm-hmm. i got there in the end and and many many people go through their whole life never doing that so i find i, I feel myself very lucky yeah it's interesting is it somebody who it's not my experience at all how the person who's like 35 and been in the same job for 30 years already or 20 years mm. already and you're like wow <laughs> what mm. is that like <laughs> yeah absolutely and hopefully it's because they found their calling in their teens and that's what it is or whether it's <laughs> yeah and also I th- and i think this is something that might other sort of neuro people might also sort of agree with for me i think looking back on it now it was because i'd created an environment that was comfortable for me. Um, mm. I knew the way things worked. I actually mm. had input into how things worked. I had some degree over how they worked. I knew the people involved. Um, I was comfortable there and it felt safe. Yes. Um, why would I want to move away from that? I'd need a really good reason. And, yeah, yeah. And that's the reality of it, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think you can get stuck in the trap of planning the next holiday, the next car, and the next Easy. house purchase. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one gets further away, one gets faster, and one gets bigger. <laughs> <laughs> but they all cost more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Just needed promotion, and then it's a sports car. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so let's dig into what you actually do as a day to day job. You, Particularly, I want to focus on your sort of, you're working with industry and your coaching consultancy. Because you mentioned earlier that you actually transitioned from the sort of, should we say, the doing part of it to moving mm. to the consulting part of it. Why did you feel you needed to do that, first of all? I think the reality is, is that for me at the time, the, the training side of things, training people how to use assistive technology and things was, was, was really exciting when I first started off. But, you know, for myself, there's only so many ways you can explain to someone how to press the read button on 
read and write. Mm-hmm. And very, very, very quickly, I found that the, the training side of things, um, I, I was struggling to keep it fresh, if I'm honest. Um, yes. especially as, as at that time, the sector I was working in, um, was, was, it was the DSA sector and it was very, um, it, it was quite samey. Um, so the opportunity to get into coaching, well, actually, the opportunity to get into coaching didn't come up. Um, the organization I worked for had coaches. Mm. And um, I knew this was something that, that sort of interested me. So, so actually, I fought like heck <laughs> to get into the coaching side of things. Um, and, and I did, uh, eventually. And, and it was there that I really, really found that actually this is this feels right, if you like. Mm. Um, and, and I really, really do enjoy doing the coaching. I don't do so much of the coaching now, um, but I do still do some. Um, and, and even now, uh, I absolutely love working with people, um, as, as a coach. And I think, what is it I enjoy about coaching? Um, the fact that actually it's not the same thing for everybody. Um, it yeah. really does mean so different things for different people, um, even in the same roles. Um, and now I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to, I've, I've moved into a little bit more around coaching supervision now as well. So actually I'm, I'm working with coaches too, who are doing the coaching and, and that's opened up a whole other sort of sphere of, of, of interest. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, and I, I absolutely love doing that. And it's, it's really, really, really good because, I mean, it, 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 it makes you reflect inward as well. Um, and, yeah. and it's great. Um, so that, and, and with Neurobox, I've got a whole other sort of, um, avenue as well, if you like, in that now I get the chance to also work with organizations, um, around, around sort of policies and disability confidence schemes and, and so on and so forth. So we're, we're working on a much larger level as well. So, these different sort of uh, layers, if you like, really, really keep everything sort of fresh and exciting and exhausting. And exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, a, in, a good, in a good way. Yes, yes, I sleep well after all of that. Mm-hmm. Now, I've had quite a few coaches. Some of them you, you probably know quite well on this podcast, but you are moved into a role where you're now the coach's coach, I suppose, coaching supervision. Mm. <laughs> What does that entail and how does that work? It's really interesting to hear from the kind of the next stage up in terms of making that all work. Yeah. Well, the whole idea of, of, of coaching supervision is it's a reflective space for the coach. Um, and, and it's an entirely safe space. Um, and absolutely anything can be raised as a topic from. A client they may be feeling a little bit stuck on, not quite sure where to go next, to reflecting back on something that they'd have liked to have done differently, to looking at things that went really well, um, and even sort of exploring things like boundaries and, and ethics and all that sort of thing. So it, it really is quite exciting when you go into a supervision session with a coach because hey, you don't know what they're going to bring to the table. Um What's really, really nice is that you, you, you have a conversation um, mm. as, as a peer. You're not there to you're not there to judge or instruct or anything like that. Uh, it's it's an exploration of whatever it is they want to bring, and you bring your your view and your angle and your experience into the conversation. Um, and it's great. It's really, really interesting. And I think it's really important, particularly for the sorts of coaching that that we do around neurodiversity because again coaching is one of those words that means so many different things but in its purest sense coaching is meant to be a non-directive interaction it's about someone trying to pull you what your goals and aspirations are and how you plan to achieve them and and, and what the accountability and all that sort of stuff is it's supposed to be very very non-directive whereas what we do is we're there as a coach, but we're also there as as a bit of an expert in that particular neurodiversity. So we're there not just as a coach, but also as a collaborator as well, if you like, and, and okay. sometimes even as an advocate. Yeah. Um, and that can lead to some really, really interesting um, sort of 
conversations around where boundaries are and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, um, it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a bit techy and geeky because that's just how my brain is. Um, so it sounds like you're very much a sounding board and I guess basically get to talk to you and bounce ideas off. And you, you, you mentioned boundary setting quite a few times as well. How do you become into that position and what sort of things do you need to learn to be effective at that kind of role? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'm not sure I've got the answer, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I think it, it, it's all the same things that you would need in order to be a good coach, okay? Yeah. Um, it's but more, more than anything else, more than anything else, it's about being able to hear people. And that's sometimes, that's sometimes difficult to remember to do, especially if you're new to coaching as well. Mm, mm. Um, because very often, we are put in a situation where we're supposed to coach someone who's, let's say, for argument's sake, dyslexic. And it's very easy to see our job to go along there and and, and basically give them solutions for all the things that they're finding difficult. Yes. Okay? Yeah. You know, so uh, I have um, with with time management, okay? So, you know, can I have some dyslexic strategies, please, to help me with my time management? Well, that's one approach we could take. And I could sit there and panic a little bit going, well, I'm, I'm rubbish at time management as well. <laughs> um, so, you know, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, but, and, and we could explore strategies and so on and so forth. But actually, what you learn after a while is that, is it really time management that we need to explore? Okay, that's, that's what we're presented with. But let's just dig into that a little bit. Let's take a really deep dive into that. And the chances are that it's not time management that we need a strategy for. There's something in that person's role that's taking them way, way longer than perhaps it should, which is having yeah. a massive impact. Okay, yes. so that's what we really need to look at. Um, and it, it's that sort of deep dive, peeling away the layers like um but, but that's coaching yeah yeah and that's a really good point there isn't it that <laughs> I, I had this a slight tangent example but i had a similar thing in a guitar lesson last week i went in the guitar teacher asked me how the piece of work that i'm learning is going i'm like it's fine but i get to this point and my left hand won't do all of this and he's like yes but everybody always blames it i'm a right handed guitarist by the way uh, everybody blames their left hand, the fretting hand, for getting it wrong. But it's like the problem is actually the right hand. It's always the right hand. And it's like, really? He's like, yeah, you're playing it like blah. blah. And he explained what I was doing wrong with all the right hand technique. And he fixed that. And the left hand magically did the thing it's meant to do. <laughs> now, but he's like, yeah, all that does is fret strings. And it's kind of that idea, isn't it? That actually you focus so much on the thing you think it is, but you do need people to bounce off to realize maybe what the thing it is actually is it <laughs> exactly and that is the key to it and I, that is the difference between that's that's the difference between finding strategies to solve problems and actually understanding what's going on if you like because in my experience most people find their own ways of dealing with problems but it's not always clear to them what it is they're meant to be solving yes yes yeah, yeah. sometimes you are yeah, it's not clear what's meant to be solving, or you think you know what it is until somebody points and it out. And then you wonder why nothing you do works. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I could have spent months trying to sort the left hand out in that example. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Two minutes, he's like, do this. Ah, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Hence the importance of a teacher, really. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Okay, now I want to kind of jump into the other arm of what you do with the workplace stuff. And, you know, mm. you know you're talking about your disability schemes and stuff within work. Now, how does that come about? Is that companies coming to yourself or Neurobox and asking for help? Or have they got policies in place and you look at it and go, maybe you can improve here? Or how does this conversation start? How do you work with a, like a big corporation? It's a fairly big machine that takes a little while for policies to bleed through and things like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and and it can come about from many many different angles. But um, 
typically we're we're approached by an organization who who wants to be better at some aspect of inclusion whether that's uh, recruitment or whether that's sort of managing their reasonable adjustments um, or it may well be an organization that has, has just realized that actually somebody's disclosed a disability to them and they don't really know what to do about that so they hit google and 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 sort of email us so <laughs> it can come about from all sorts of different ways but again it's we always take the time to sort of understand exactly what is really being asked for here mm. or, or, and what's needed. Um, and yeah, it, it really does vary. Um, we've just finished working with a really wonderful um, organization, um, helping them to get their disability confident level three accreditation. Um, and that, that was a lovely thing to go through and do. Um, and, uh, another organization that we work with, um, they had lots and lots of things in place, actually, but they, they weren't sure that what they were doing was everything they could be doing. So they reached out to us to, to audit some areas of their business for neuro inclusion. Mm. Um, and that was a bit of a deep dive into policies and, and, and things like that. Um, but I would say that, that probably the thing we get asked for most is, is help with specific situations. Right. Um, yes. Specific, uh, ease or, or situations that have arisen. Um, but increasingly as well, we're being asked, and this is really, really nice. Um, uh, we're being asked to support middle managers, line managers and, and so on and so forth. Oh, because yeah. what a lot of companies are realizing is that on a, on, on a high level, they can have all the policies in place that they want. Um, but the people that actually decide whether those policies are enacted usefully or not tend to be the people in the, in the sort of the middle layers of the organization. So lots of management training around not just some of the legalities of it, but also the practicalities of it. So for example, if I've got a member of my team who is having a reasonable adjustment for a particular reason. Um, but other members of my team feel a little bit sort of uh, put out about this because they're not getting it. How do I deal with that without mm. disclosing a disability? And, and, you know, how do I manage all of that? Yeah. yeah lots yeah. and lots of training and conversations around that, essentially to help managers feel more confident with this. Because if they're confident with it, um, the chances are that more people are going to disclose to them. Um, and then it, it just starts rolling from there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very good point. Cause you know, if we touched on the remarkable tablet before, but you suddenly get this, you know, let's not be around a bush, quite an expensive piece of technology that's fairly new mm -hmm. to people mm -hmm. sat on your desk all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And you like, what's that? Yeah. And you either look like a really flash person who's managed to spend a lot of money and didn't buy an iPad. Or do you explain? <laughs> That's a tricky one to kind of manage, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And managers are put in very difficult positions because they've got to got to manage the whole team, and the whole team needs to work together and be happy. But at the same time, they obviously have to keep confidences as well. Um, and, mm -hmm. and how do you do that? What does the conversation look like? Um, so that's being sort of noticed more and more. Uh, in, in organizations, I think, um, yeah. at the moment, which is, which is great. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And I think that is a, is a, it's really interesting, isn't it? How do you balance all these things? Like, yeah. 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 We've even coined a term for it. It's called adjustment envy. Adjustment envy. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I like it. Yes. Cause it is the case, isn't it? I haven't heard this said to me for, for years and years and years. And it out of the neurodiversity context, but it's like if you have X thing, everybody else will want it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I think it's even more so the case with with sort of neurodiversities, if you like, um, because actually many of the challenges that that our neurodiverse brains struggle with, fickle people also experience that. They know what that feels like maybe on a different level and maybe not nearly as much, but they'll know what that feels like. So yeah, actually, yeah. if you've got something that will help you with that, why can't I? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that is a very good point because 
But yeah, yeah. What works for neurodiversity normally works for everybody else. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, that's really interesting. Now, just as a sort of top level kind of thing, if you're dealing with a company where you come out, dive out the middle management sort of coaching level, but the higher level, and you're looking at it, policies, I, I appreciate it's going. It's a massive task, but. What sort of things you were looking for? How do organizations improve their neurodiversity policies and inclusion? Yeah, you're right. That is a really difficult one to answer. Um, <laughs> but the, so what, what, what are we looking for? Um, I suppose a few things. Um, certainly the, the wording and the language used. Um, one of the things that our society likes is lots of medical terminology and medical language and legalese, if you like. Okay. Um, and that's, and that's fine. Um, and, and it's usually accepted practice to mirror that language when you're building your policies, for example, but that doesn't make those policies particularly friendly, no. if you like. No. Um, yeah. so looking at the wording that's used in these sorts of policies is, is very often a, a good starting point. Um, making sure that, that what should be in there is in there. Um, so for example, things like, you know, recruitment processes being inclusive, um, you know, looking at, say, for example, can, can people apply in different formats? Is there an application mm. form? What's that form like? Can people save the web? You shouldn't come back to it later or have they got to sit there and do it all in one go? Those sorts of things. Um, but, in regards to policies, it's really about making them making them as comfortable for people as possible. But also, they've got to be they've got to be practical and real. There's no yeah. point just putting a load of nice to haves down. Um, it's got to be doable and practical. So yeah, it really is very very different for different businesses. But very often, it's not the policies that are the issue. It's the fact that the policies exist, but they're just not feeding through into what's actually going on. Yes, yes, yes. So it's not necessarily, as you already touched on, it's not always just the top-down approach. You've got to exactly. go yeah. mid-level and bottom-up. No. Yeah, and it's often the case, but that shouldn't be happening because we've got a policy that says we do it like this. <laughs> and yeah, you have got a policy, but, and you're right, everybody should be doing it that way. And really, we need to understand why. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of that thinking. Yeah, and that's interesting. And do you do much work on how you can get not just the top-down, trickle-down of policies to all the middle managers? Because purely with a big company, there's a lot of middle managers to deal with. Uh -huh. like, it's a large organization. Right? And, you, and I guess you know, it's impractical to talk to every single one. How do you manage to get the most impact with that? How do you manage to, to sort of buy in the most amount of kind of the levels that need to buy into it, really? Yeah, and, and it really does depend on the type and size of the organization, but the communication, um, the, the marketing around it, <laughs> if you like, okay, yeah. is, is really, really key. Um, and again, it's, it's kind of one of those sort of chicken and because mm. again you can have all the messaging that you want but if it's not being believed it's pointless so at yes. some yeah. point you, you you've got to have role models you, the, the one of the best things an organization can do is, is have managers who are disabled neurodiverse come forward with their stories um, and share their experiences um, lots and lots of case studies like that um, employee resource groups, um, having the, have, have, we, we've got an a company dyslexia association, for example, or company, you know, employee resource groups are a great thing to have, but basically just making it part of normal conversation. It's, and, and that's something that, again, we go back to the language. Um, that's a big barrier to making neurodiversity part of the normal conversation what's the language i should be using can i say neurodivergent is it neurodivergent it's really confusing is somebody dyslexic or do they have dyslexic i can't get it wrong do you know what it's easy if i just don't raise it okay <laughs> yeah the, the language itself is quite exclusive okay <laughs> it's, it's, 
Uh, and, and just sort of dealing with that in the first instance is the first step to just making the conversations easy to have. And actually, it's one of the easiest conversations to have because, you know, even if you're not neurodiverse yourself, you're going to know somebody who is, you know, oh, and yes. yeah. it's, it's a really easy conversation to have, but we've got to take away the, um, the fear from it, especially for managers. Because again, the consequences of upsetting someone, of discriminating against someone, penalties are quite severe. So mm. again, it's a very scary area for managers to go into. Yes. Yes. Of course it is. Yeah. Yeah. And language is very important, but. It's tricky, isn't it? Oh, the it's very important to a stuff. point um, yeah, at, yeah. at which then it starts becoming counterproductive. Um, yes. I would rather people use incorrect or politically incorrect language, but we had an important conversation. Yes, you are completely right with that, actually, that if it becomes a barrier to having open communication and, you know, if the person who uses incorrect language but it's from the right place, then enters into a lengthy conversation and learns something and understands more and improves their understanding then. Exactly. Yeah. Ultimately, that's what we're after, aren't we? Yeah. 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 <laughs> now, every episode gets three rapid-fire questions from me at the end as we wind up on that stuff. <laughs> now, they're rapid-fire from me, but they don't need rapid-fire answers from you. So let's dive into question number one. What prejudice have you had about dyslexia that's been proven wrong? That all people with dyslexia read slowly. Yes. Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Having spoken to a lot of people with dyslexia, it's funny how the reading thing comes up a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's the reading one. <laughs> it's deeper than that. <laughs> okay. Question number two. If an alien landed and you had to describe dyslexia to them, how would you do it? Communicating in my language might be difficult for me. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. And the final question of the podcast, and you're not allowed to promote your own things here. Now, seeing as this is the Dyslexia Life Hack show, what is your favorite Dyslexia Life Hack? I think it's learning... It's learning to not be so hard on myself. Mm. Yes. I think. Yes. Sounds quite trite, but no, no. Gen genuinely, just to not beat yourself up quite so much. Yes. Yeah. I think that's very important. I think, particularly, you know, not just people in neurodiversity, but people are just internally beat themselves up all the time. Yeah. And it's quite limiting. Yeah. And it's exhausting as well. It is tiring. Yes, yes. Yes, it's interesting how when you start losing the shackles of that, so to speak, how things start to open up more than you kind of realised. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Now, before we sign off, is there anything else you'd like to add? And if you'd like, is there anywhere people can find you? You can find me on LinkedIn or at Neurobots. And, of course, people can find Neurobots really easily. You can find us at www.neurobox.co.uk um, and Matt will put all the links in as, yes. as, as you usually do as well. Okay. Uh, always in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Yeah. Now, thank you, Mark, for taking the time to come on this evening. It's been a really fascinating conversation and really interesting on the topics we've been diving into. And it's been great you've been able to take the time out of your evening to come on and talk to me. My pleasure. But I am going for a lie down then. <laughs> in a cold room right <laughs> well that just leaves me to thank everybody else for taking the time to listen and I will talk to you in the next episode goodbye for now <laughs> <laughs>